This is my name. Uh, so I'm in charge of the uh, of the development of activity at the and uh, we do uh, the river quality and uh, and sorry. Ask, can can someone ask the lady to speak in the microphone, please? Interpreters cannot hear. Uh, Okay. Sorry, lady is too far from the microphone. I'll try to give you the context of the project, and then Eloise will uh, will do the presentation of the work and the return of experience. So I'm uh, I've done a CIFRA PhD too. Sorry. So on the, everything that has to do with uh, diatomia di macroalga in intermittent rivers. And in the 2010, with the issue of climate change, uh, uh, and those are uh, there are issues that we look into, and there are new techniques uh, in terms of en environmental monitoring, which are techniques associ associated with uh, environmental DNA. The uh, the there will be co action cost action carried out at the European level into the. Uh, and the research project in, in our domain to uh, diaconet, DNA quinet, sorry, which talks mice and DNA quinet. Uh, they lay in our activities at the Eurofans at the time, which is mainly analysis, lab, uh, analysis laboratory. The hydrobiology was kind of, you know, uh, spunctual, but now they, are, they strongly developed this. And at the end of the 2017, there was a reorganization within the group and everything that is environmental specialty was uh, developed, is being developed. And hydrobiology activities are part of uh, thereof. And uh, there will be a, a call on the 10 years of AquaRef and uh, on the monitoring of aquatic environment, the water environment, and the reflections are, are coming up. So how could we become players of the evolutions on the, uh, in the business? So as of uh, after that, we started thinking, I got in touch with my former partners with whom I work at the, uni uh, the academic world and I did discuss this at the uh, it was the INREA in Lyon, and we talked about the setup. The organization we recruited the other partners, the IDRA in Tonon, which works for the uh, and also the Lyon University, which is a more a laboratory on hydrobiology. Then as of the second semester now we organized the we set up the project we defined a project defined a budget so another project we looked for funding we recruited uh, phd students will be eloise actually and the spin-off so obviously for your friends would be to recruit and to train a specialist in those uh, specialized in the innovative techniques to remain uh, the leaders in this domain but also to reinforce our link with research, public partners, and uh, beyond that, uh, for everything that is development of activities, the fact that uh, we have this activity gives us a scientific credibility, which is certainly uh, you know obvious, and to keep uh, doing uh, monitoring uh, scientific uh, surveillance or intelligence. I give the floor now to uh, Veronique. Good morning. I'm, I'm very happy to be here to, to today. To I'm in my first third year in PhD. I'm uh, you know last uh, stretch and uh, home run. And as Amelie said. Uh, I've worked with zero fast and four laboratories for this project. I collaborate with them. And my, in my PhD project, I work on the environmental DNA and how can we use environmental DNA to monitor bio aquatic di biodiversity 
for bio and to establish bioindicators and assess the quality of the eco aquatic ecosystem. What is environmental DNA? Well, I, you all know, I suppose, what DNA is all about is one of the molecules that forms life, you know, and we find that in any living being. Uh, and it carries our uh, genetic information or identity cards. So what is environmental DNA? It is the DNA that will be released by all uh, living um, uh, beings in their environment. We humans, we uh, release DNA, we know door handle or when we cough, we leave DNA traces. We're living organisms. The aquatic biodiversity, well, does exactly the same thing. They release DNA constantly in different forms. If I had the urine, feces, uh, discrimination, cell discrimination, uh, and the DNA pool will be found in water, which could be uh, full cells, tissues, or even mitochondria. And therefore, this DNA will de become degraded and will degrade into small fragments. There recently we came the concept of DNA and environmental DNA, which can be extracted directly from an environmental sample, be it water or even from the ground, and now from the atmosphere. And we collect this DNA, and therefore we can detect and follow biodiversity thanks to sequencing, uh, high rate sequencing technique. Thanks to a sample of water, with a water sample, we can filter the DNA and uh, identify all species which are uh, which are part of this ecosystem. This uh, uh, this is a new science, only ten years of age, and it's a implementation. Well, although it is very promising, it is still limited because of several. Uh, uh, problems because for the problem of the bio indications, two main barriers, well, the application of environmental uh, DNA for the uh, uh, biodiversity, well, the fundamental blockages, but for the dynamics of DNA, uh, DNA uh, emitted in an environment, how long does it remain there? How long could, is it valid or detectable? Uh, at what distance uh, can it be detected? Is it several meters, several kilometers? All those are uh, still, uh, this is still under study, and there are also methodology problem. And one of the main problem with uh, the environmental DNA, it is, is the sampling method. As you can imagine, DNA is in small quantities in the environment, and therefore, there are methods to collect the environment, but they're not optimal. The standard method to collect DNA is to filter large quantities of water, but it so happened that this, this is time consuming and uh, calls for uh, specialized equipment, difficult to implement, and especially in complex habitats or habitats that are difficult to access. So the objectives of my PhD or my thesis, two main objectives. First one would be to to uh, work to study the dynamics of environmental DNA in macrocosm, in macrocosm to uh, find the, to see the quantity, the shape or the dynamics of DNA could be different depending on the aquatic species. So then I'll talk more specifically about the second main objectives of, objective of my thesis, more two years spent on this to remove a barrier, a methodological barrier by developing uh, the, with the, uh, a sensor, uh, uh, the environmental DNA base, passive sensors to facilitate the sampling of the, and the third objective will be to, uh, to deploy the sensors at the larger scope in a river in the, uh, and, uh, The sensors, as you can see, are sensors that have been uh, 3D printers printed. Uh, so why 3D printing? Because it makes it possible to print a certain number of, uh, to, to shape a certain number of objects at the same time and to, and to have an identical object. And the idea here would have to, uh, an object easy to handle, to handle that could be installed in any aquatic environment and which could collect uh, the DNA of uh, living uh, uh, species without human intervention. So 
we used an uh, HA uh, resin. It is hydroxyapatite. It is known to uh, uh, to do passive DNA passive accumulation, and it protects it against degradation. That's why we can it can be uh, then it can be collected easily. There is a DNA accumulation through an AD, AD sorption mechanism. See, it is a link between DNA and the surface. And then uh, we designed the sensor in such a way that the shape, the geometry, and porosity should be optimal to uh, take DNA, environmental DNA samples, the, to capture them. So the sensors are very, are very simple. The protocol is very simple. First, you know, we do a burning decontamination to remove any form of contamination. Then they immersed into the ecosystem to collect DNA. Then they dried up, washed, and they're placed in a solution that will make it possible to dissolve DNA. From this solution, we'll be able to analyze the DNA and quantify or sequence it to identify the species we want to look for. Let me show you two main results I got uh, during this. So uh, I tried to uh, test the cap cap capacity of sensor to detect one sp specific uh, target species. It is the Acelus aquaticus. Uh, it's an isopod, which is uh, lagged by the then. And we had the farm, you know, we had farms, you know, we had, that's why it's easier to use this species. So I did the, this in microcosm. I placed the isopods with uh, sensors for 24 hours. And then uh, you see the DNA quantity collected by each sensor. One dot is one sensor. And you see in the experiment, well, seven sensors out of eight made it possible to detect this uh, species just by collecting a large, a significant quantity of DNA. Then after that, we wanted to confirm this in natural environment. And we did an experiment this time we in a pond in a pond in Lyon, which has a significant population of those isopods, and we placed nine sensors uh, uh, in the uh, or captors in the uh, in the pond. So we see the quantity of DNA collected in yellow in nine locations in the pond, and we compared it versus a conventional sampling method in blue, which is the water filtration, as I said earlier on. We were able to observe that seven sensors are kept us out of nine, where they had actually identified this species, whereas for filtration, it was only three samples of filtered water that made it possible to identify these uh, beasties. So since co captors collected uh, gave us very promising results, they, uh, the, well, now the rest of my thesis will be to test uh, sensors in more complex environments. We did a campaign in May. We placed the, the sensors in an intermittent river, which is dried in part of the in six locations. And a, out of the six uh, stations, we did the monitoring, conventional monitoring of biodiversity, and we paid attention to the microinvertebrates. And the second step would be to uh, tackle another problem, which I identify, which is the re reproducibility. Uh, sometimes sense, uh, the sensors were were, pro were to show the certain variability in the collection of DNA from one experiment to the next uh, uh, to another. The results may vary. So the idea now is to work on this. We work we we work with a laboratory which is specialized in science of material science, and we try to better understand the interaction between DNA and sensors to provide a sampling, a replicable and reusable sense uh, system in all aquatic environments. And I want to conclude on this note, one minute, uh, uh, my third year, and I can do a global return of experience on what is the CIFRE thesis and what are the advantages. Well, uh, for PhD students who want to launch into a CIFRE thesis and for the former uh, mentor or tutors, well, uh, it made it possible for me, it still makes it possible to work on the research themes which are highly applied and which is uh, something essential for me. It provides a diversity of skills and knowledge because to work with uh, uh, individuals for any domain, it gives you different views on the thesis that was very enriching. Work with a company makes it possible to always be connected to the reality or on the ground and to always uh, refocus my attention on the objectives of the project. And last point, but not least, at the level of professional insertion, we know that uh, uh, 
for young uh, PhD uh, uh, students, uh, you know, professional insertion is not always and, uh, easy, we know so easy, but uh, with the CIFRE thesis, you know, we know the company and we already have a foot in the, in the door. So it's, uh, thing. thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We got time for a couple of questions. So, uh, thank you for this clear presentation. Just one comment on organism do not have DNA. Yes, we know that. So, first point. Second point if we want to uh, identify species, well, you know, you need to sequence these target species. Yes. But that's another point. I mean, you cannot be in blurry situations saying, oh, let's go and probe it and see what we we capture. Where well, you have to understand, you identify your target uh, species, second questions rapidly. Uh, one day, could we imagine that we would do a quantitative? Uh, that's a good question. This is being pondered, uh, which is at the heart of the. Uh, of research on environmental DNA. For the time being, that's not the case, but lots of work uh, uh, works uh, use a quantitative PCR or DPCRs, so, which make it possible to quantify the DNA of one target species. And uh, works are in progress to link the DNA quantity with, with the number of species, but it's not, uh, not running yet. It's not reliable yet. But when it comes to uh, sequencing, of course, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I wanted to have a broad presentation, but you, we need a DNA database, of course, which includes all the, the sequences of the known species to identify them, of course. No, no. Pas de micro, pas de traduction, désolé. No, no microphone, no translation, sorry. Whatever the question was, it is something I tested during my thesis and uh, to see how long, what was the optimal time for the census. But it uh, so happens that after one week, uh, we reach a maximum threshold. We don't get more DNA that, uh, you know, you reach just kind of a maximum. And then if we leave them too long in the natural environment that the census, they, they clog, the you know, leaves, dead leaves and vegetation. Well, 24 hours seems to be the ideal period of time. Thank you. One last question. Very practical, uh, size and cost of a sensor. The, the size and the cost, yeah. Well, very small. Two square centimeters and uh, it, it's suitable for uh, experience at small scale, but in the larger scale, we would have to have larger uh, sensors or probes but 3D printing, we can do just about what we want, but the cost would, a good question, that cost. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, well, the main cost will be, of course, the the raw material that is quite costly, but the advantage that afterward they can be reused. So it is the initial cost, but then they, 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 they can be reused. So I can, I can give you a clear or a sharp uh, um, precise figure, sorry. And a last question. Without a microphone, the interpreters cannot interpret. Elodie Brudeau. So the link between companies and research is always very exciting. What is your daily experience if you're in a research lab in a company? And with respect to the company, how do you follow the work on a day-to-day -day basis? So I spend 90% of my time at the inner, so I work in four and now five labs, in fact, and I'm only one person and I can't be everywhere. So we have a molecular biology platform and that's where I do all of my experiments. So I try and spend a little bit of time in all of the labs. I try and give presentations and, and keep, con keep in contact with them. 
Um, so I spend little time in, in companies, but I've done all of my field campaigns with um, Eurofins agents, and that was important for me. So I'm not always next to Eloise supervising her. As she said, there are many, many partners for this project. So it's already quite complex for her, but she's uh, managing very well, and it's not always easy uh, being among all of these people. And then in terms of the supervisory team, uh, so we often keep in touch. We mix up the teams uh, with her when she goes out into the field, whenever it's possible. So we also try and program things uh, you know, to manage time better. So we try and spend some time in the laboratory to see what's happening, uh, what's happening in the lab. And then for applications, we've got people who can answer those questions. So when, when she needs, she knows that she can cause them. We have an organization that's not that simple. It's not a lab on one side. We've got labs all over France. So the teams don't meet up all the time. And we, we meet up maybe three or four times a year. We have a webinar with our teams, all of the teams who can talk with her and uh, answer questions and give her other ideas or, or things uh, to think about. I don't know whether that answers your question.